And it is a misunderstanding of grace. And I've heard nationally known speakers say grace is just for guilt. Well, that's as unbiblical as anything you can find. I don't have time to do a study on grace, but I urge you to do an inductive study on grace. And you'll see that it has to do with many, many things. Grace is God acting in my life. That's what grace is. Grace is God acting in my life. And so when Peter says grow in grace... He's not saying grow in forgiveness. He's saying grow in an interactive relationship with God. Grow in the extent to which interaction with God is a part of your life. And all of those areas in the circle diagram, you see, you take grace into those. And when we do that, then our kingdom begins to flourish because it's in God's kingdom. And that's what God meant. He meant for it to flourish. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that in due season he may exalt you. Isn't that interesting? God intends to exalt you. But not on your terms. On his terms. And that's much better, believe me. Much better. So humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, that in due season he may exalt you, casting all your cares upon him because he cares for you. So you can lay down. Your, you don't have to run the thing. And the quicker you take your hands off and abandon outcomes and all of that, the better off you are. Now, it's not opposed to action. Grace does not make us passive. The kingdom is a very active thing. And we have to remember that grace is not opposed to effort. And many people haven't figured that out. They think if they get really pushing their pursuit of God that it will make him nervous. Grace is not opposed to effort. It's opposed to earning. Earning is an attitude. And you never try to deal with God on that basis. So now, salvation then is being caught up in the life Jesus is now living on earth. It isn't just having the thing signed for where you're going to wind up. Just like being lost is not a matter of where you're going to wind up, it's a matter of not knowing where you are. That's what you, You're lost when you don't know where you are. Not when you don't know where you're going. You can know where you're going, but not know where you are. And if you don't know where you are, you're lost, and a map won't help you. So, uh, salvation is being caught up in the life that Jesus is now living on earth. And I give you there Colossians 3, 3, 1 through 4. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things that are above. That's what comes after the cross. You then be risen with Christ, seek those things that are above, where Christ is seated on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth, because you're dead. Hey, didn't we hear that somewhere before? Yeah. See, that's the cross. That's the cross that lifts this incredible burden of having to be happy. Oh, I just want to be happy. Well, rot's a rock. You know, if that's all you want, you're nailed. And you're headed for addiction of some sort. No. Now, you'll be happy, but that's a side effect. See? That's a side effect. You actually won't be happy, you'll be joyful. Which is much better to understand. Because you can actually be joyful in times of sorrow. But you can't be happy in times of sorrow. So you're going to have something much better. And that takes the form now, you see. You're dead. And your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then you will also appear. Glorious. Well, that's what you were looking for, wasn't it? That's what God made you for. And so we have to rethink these matters in such a way 
that the cross becomes the great doorway into life. And um, the cross sets aside the flesh as the ruler of our lives. And you have many dimensions of it. I've mentioned some. Uh, the passage here in, uh, Coloss- in uh, Colossians 2 uh, is a beautiful statement. Usually we just wind up with verse 14, 214 because we're thinking only in terms of sin. But when you look at this whole passage, you'll see that in him, verse 11, you also were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. How do you do that? In the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Now, what do you th- is that we're going to kill ourselves now? How are you going to remove the body of the flesh? It isn't your fleshly body he's talking about. He's talking about the life you have made out of the flesh. That is, apart from God. That's going to get cut off, circumcised, the circumcision. And when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, that is when that flesh was still on there and that was your life, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificates of debt consisting of the decrees against us that was hostile to us. He's taken them out of the way and nailed them to the cross. Okay, so that took care of that. But don't forget about the next verse. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. What's he talking about? He's talking about the powers around you that get a hold of your flesh and squeeze you like a lemon. And he's saying, you have been set free from that. You now have a place to stand. You have a life apart from what is presented to you as the good life in the world. You now have another place to stand. And that's where what God sees you to be is coming to pass. And all of the attacks upon us, we have to remember to see ourselves as God sees us in his world. And if we don't have that place, then all of these things around us will just jump on us and work us Uh, back into the flesh, hopelessness, deadness, alienation from God. But when we're dealing with desire and habit and all those sorts of things, that's where we have to go to. Uh, I, uh, Pastor shortly was talking about uh, how his wife had become disappointed in him and in this case had not actually had sex with another person but had sort of become emotionally attached to him and how it had hurt him and all this sort of thing. You see, if he keeps seeing him as he thinks his wife sees him, he's dead. He has to put that aside and say, there is a life in which I am whole before God. And I'm going to stand there. And actually, that provides, provided him a basis for going back to his wife and communicating with her and coming to understandings that enable them to come back together at a deeper level than they'd ever had before. But you have to have that place to stand, and that's the cross. That's what God did for us by opening up the world of the kingdom and allowing us to come into it. Now, you have to distinguish the cross as God's act from the cross as your choice. And that's where we go back to our first verse. The cross as your choice is your cross. It is not Christ's cross. Now, when you have assumed it, you can identify with the cross of Christ in such a way that, this is marvelous old saying from medieval Christians, We enter through the wounds of his humanity into the depths of his divinity. That is to say, we we accept our place on the cross with him. And what an incredible release it is when we do that. Uh, 
It doesn't cure every problem, but it gives you a way of working on problems that is hopeful and will certainly succeed. And as we move then into identification with that, the depths of his divinity becomes our life. And we can stand there and all of the aspects of the self where evil has been hidden in our flesh, in our natural abilities, uh, can progressively be changed. But we have to understand we have two wills. One is an impulsive will. I call it here a vital will. And there is a reflective will. And if we don't come to terms with that distinction with us, our vital will will constantly harm us because we will then be at the disposal of our feelings. Vital will is impulsive will. It is governed by feelings. Reflective will is will oriented towards what is good for the person as a whole, not towards the merely desired. And our culture really betrays us because it doesn't allow us to distinguish the good from what is desired. And we have to draw that distinction in order, in order to be able to, to look at our desires and say, that isn't necessarily good. We can't move, if we don't have that, we can't move to the point of saying, our desires do not have authority over us. Something higher has authority over us. And that is God and what is good and what is true, and what is beautiful, and then we can pursue those things once we have begun to step into the kingdom and receive the grace of God into every aspect of our lives. Uh, this is also tied up with the confusions about love. Uh, many people think love is desire. Love is not desire. Love is the intention to act for the good of the object. That's what love is. It's the intention to act for the good of the object. Now, I might say I love chocolate cake, but I don't. I am not prepared to act for the good of chocolate cake. I want to eat it. That's desire. And so we have to distinguish these and try to uh, keep them clear. And the redemption of the will begins then. Jesus in his kingdom restores the will to service for God. And all that is true, that is good, and that is beautiful. It's so important for us to understand all this because it is a part of the drama of human life to live for what is true, for what is good, and what is beautiful. And if you live for that, uh, then your life will be full. And some people will even substitute that for God. But what we know is you cannot effectively live for that unless you're alive in the kingdom of God through faith in Jesus Christ and experiencing the influx of his grace constantly. And then you're able to do it. And the body, now the servant of the spirit or will under God, and remember now the proper and improper subordinations from an earlier slide. Well, I'm going to have to conclude. Uh, let me just do it by saying this. A look at the last page of your notes, the reliable pattern of kingdom growth. Everything that we see in the scriptures is there for us to have. God has made it possible. And the reliable pattern of kingdom growth is always vision. You have to see how things are. And then you have to decide. And the most serious question that any of us would face today is, have I decided to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? Am I a disciple? Have I found the way of the cross? And am I learning constantly from Jesus how to live my life as he would live my life if he were I? Now, if I have made that decision, by the way, that should be spelled I-N-T-E-N-T-I-O-N -E -T instead of S. If I have made that decision, if I have that intention, then I need to access the means. And the means I've listed here under four headings, proclamation of the gospel. That is fundamental. You can't go anywhere without that. And the gospel is trust Jesus Christ and Walk into the kingdom of God here and now. Heaven will take care of itself if you take care of heaven now. 
And you do that by trusting Jesus. Not something he said, nor something he did, but by trusting him. And that means to bring him into every aspect of life and to be learning from him there. Then ministry, we need that. And you, you're good at that. And, and you, you want to make it better even. Uh, ministry in the power of God to those in need. Uh, ministry to the physical body, to the, the depths of the soul. Then teaching. Uh, we have to have teaching. Uh, teaching of, the, of what Jesus is and what he said and what he did, it cannot be replaced by experience. Teaching leads us into action, and that is where character is formed. So if you want the character of Christ, if you want to live in his holiness and his power, then you have to step into the teaching and say, yes, this is for me. That means, among other things, I'm learning to do the things he said do. And we could illustrate that in many ways. Uh, for example, he said, bless those who curse you. You can learn to do that if you want to do that. You need to know that that is for you. Now, that's, this is hard in our context because most of our teaching has been that you can't do the commandments of Jesus. And you can't if all you do is try. But if you also train as his disciple... There's not a single one of them you can't do. Don't worry about perfection. It'll take you a few months before you have to worry about that. <laughs> See. But, for example, you could bless those who curse you. And if you drive out here, you have plenty of opportunities for that. Right? <laughs> you can do it. To bless means to will the good of another under the invocation of God. And we might add, not through gritted teeth. It's to genuinely will the good of another under the invocation of God. That's blessing. And that alone, if it were brought into our homes and our workplaces and everywhere, would just make a huge difference in our lives. Of course, you can only do it by grace, but the grace is available, and we can learn how to do that. Now, if we run into problems on that, then we need disciplines. And disciplines are... Special kinds of practices that help us get in a position to do the things that Jesus commanded. Uh, for example, if you find yourself exhausted, you will find it's much harder to bless those who curse you. Uh, if you find yourself locked into a rat race and you feel like you've got to get yours, you will never bless those who curse you. If you are alive in the kingdom of God and know that God has cared for you and will care for you, then you'll find it easy to bless people because you won't be so mad. It's very hard to bless when you're mad. You ever notice that? And so you have to slow down. You have to learn to not push so hard. You have to learn to take times of solitude and silence where you do nothing. The way that's what can break you from the habit of trying to do everything. And it may sound very strange to you, but actually the law of Sabbath indicates that you should have one-seventh of your time in which you do nothing in the way of work. And Jesus said, the Sabbath is made for man. It's a good thing. But most of us couldn't possibly practice Sabbath unless we had already practiced solitude and broken our incredible habits of rushing from one thing to another so that we're at peace. When you go into solitude, you have to go into solitude long enough for it to begin to take effect. Right? You have to stop jerking. And after you stop jerking a little while there, you may discover you actually have a soul. And that God is interested in you. And that maybe what you get out of your life is the person you become and not what you accomplish. Mm. You see, that now your mind is changing. You, your feelings are changing. And blessing those who curse you is a breeze at that point. And, Am I saying anything that makes any sense? See, 
So you have to get a hold of this. Uh, this idea of discipline is basically you're doing something that enables you to do what you cannot do by direct effort. That's discipline. So if you're, like if you're trying to resist temptation, sexual temptation, you have to view the object differently. You have to think differently. And the only cure for lust is love. You love people, you won't lust them. Now, that's a, a tricky subject, but basically that's the way you learn to handle it. Just like if you love people, you won't curse them back if they curse you. But you have to be in the space of love, the space of the kingdom of God. And then when we do that, then we begin to find that, in fact, everything Jesus taught we can do from the heart out. That's why Matthew 5.20 is so important. You have to go beyond the righteousness of the scribe and the Pharisee. The righteousness of the scribe and the Pharisee is, don't do it. I didn't do it. I didn't kill anybody. I didn't have sex with them. And Jesus says, you know, you've got a long ways to go yet. And then he shifts immediately to the heart. Right. See, if you, if you want to not kill people, probably you can manage that very nicely by getting rid of anger. Hmm? And contempt. So that's what Jesus... Don't, don't just try to avoid the action. Avoid the condition that leads the action. And that's beyond the righteousness of the scribe and the Pharisee. See, that's, that's what you do. And Jesus, all of Jesus' teaching there in the Sermon on the Mount after 520 are illustrations of that. And by the way, you have to take them in order. If you, say, if you start out trying to turn the cheek before you've dealt with anger, you think it'll work? No. And you have to deal with the fundamental issues, desire, anger, contempt, and so on. And then dealing with the other things are much easier. Because you have to deal with that inner condition. Now, relational wholeness comes as relations are purged of rejection and attack as we walk with Jesus in his kingdom. That's a process. And because we're working with grace, if we fail... In that, we don't want to fall back into self-condemnation and so on. That's when we return to the cross and say, he died for me. He died for me. See? And then we say, be my teacher. Walk with me. I'm your disciple. Teach me how to do this. And the, the, the wounds that are in the relationships, and nearly all of these issues are rooted deeply in family relations. And sometimes they are so far back that the people are dead and we still have relation to them. And how many of you know that you can't avoid that? And often they're very good. I'm blessed to have some wonderful relationships in my family that strengthened me and helped me. Um, and uh, I'm... I, I haven't had the kind of wounds that many people have had in those relationships. But the important thing to understand is that the relational problems take care of themselves with minimal attention when the relationship to Christ and his kingdom is in place. And we have to beware of becoming obsessed with those problems and not moving on to taking them into Christ. We have to deal with them. I'm not suggesting that we not deal with them. But we always want to deal with them in the context of discipleship to Jesus in his kingdom. And then the, the weight of the wounds that we're carrying and so on can be dealt with. And our lives can be conducted in the power, hope, and joy of Jesus' life in us. I love what Paul says in Romans 15:13 Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit and that is what is given to us as disciples of Jesus in the way of the cross Thank you I think I'd better stop there and let me just say a word of prayer here now 
Father, we ask you to give us what we need. You are the one who is in charge of your word. And you know every one of our hearts and lives as we are here today. And so we ask now that you be the teacher. And that if there's anything harmful in what has been said, that you would remove that. Change it. Adapt it all to our individual needs. That we might walk in the wholeness of life with our brothers and sisters, our neighbors, as we go on from this day, as your disciples in the way of the cross. Amen. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. God bless you, everyone. Um, We're going with Dallas right now to an important meeting. Several of you have asked if you could speak with him. Unfortunately, there will not be that time right now. So um, bless you all, and uh, we shall see you back at 2 o'clock.